everybody. Thank you for coming along. I think we filled up pretty much every seat, so it's good to see a clamour for Malaysian history. Um, I'm Ben Ashbridge, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of History, uh, a member of the Churchill MCR. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about some research that I did last year, which uh, soon enough, fingers crossed, will be published in uh, the Journal for Southeast Asian Studies, which is kind of cool. Um, just a little announcement to begin with, I've tried to condense a huge amount of material uh, into quite a short talk uh, and it, I could go wrong, it's the first time I've formally presented this rather than blathered on about it after a couple of beers. Um, so we'll see how it pans out. Uh, so I've called this talk Communism, Nationalism and Religion in 1950s Malaya because whilst these are all vast topics which people have written a ton of books about, my work uh, sits somewhere in the intersection of these topics. Uh, so today we're going to try and investigate issues of socio-cultural and religious identity amongst ethnic Chinese groups during this period, uh, and doing so through an analysis of British Christian missionaries. And I'll let Jack come in. Uh, so to start with, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit through the idea Behind, which got me to this sort of mode of analysis. So firstly, my work interacts with studies of politics as a sort of communism and nationalism in the title indicates. And specifically, I'm interested in moments of political flux uh, and instability and the impact of that volatility and transition. And the reason is that moments of change, uh, especially change in power, which politics essentially is, um, are moments of profound possibilities, and whilst the outcomes might seem kind of obvious to us in hindsight, at the time everybody's scrambling to define what this change will be and what the next stage will be in this power relation. And I've taken that to what I think is the logical uh, conclusion uh, with by looking at moments of decolonization, so points of shifting power from in empire to nation to independence, um, and I've taken that to another extreme by looking at moments of violent anti-colonial movements. And the violence is important here because decolonization can take place peacefully when empire doesn't perceive the threat to be ideologically dangerous. But when there is violence, it means that it was perceived as ideologically dangerous and therefore the conflict is much more in, uh, interesting, in my opinion, and exacerbated. So these changes can take on a much more obvious form. Kind of makes it easy to study. Um, next is I'm looking at society and culture because I try and look to socio-cultural uh, reactions and transformations during these moments of political revolution. Mostly because these moments have been predominantly overlooked, but this is how, this is how we consider what's actually impacted the lives of people on the ground and reshaped cultures and society. Um, unfortunately, the reason this has often been overlooked is partly because the politics is interesting, headline grabbing, but it's also because the materials we have to work from are really written either by the colonial elite, and their, their uh, interpretation is often a little bit biased, they don't write about the th these sort of things, the lives of everyday people, or by the nationalist elite, who also are not particularly interested in documenting the lives and cultures of the 90% of the people on the ground. They're more talking about their great political triumph over the colonialists. And so that's where we get to this third element, religion. What I do is try to unpack uh, mission resources from Christian missionaries as people who are on the ground operating amongst uh, the general population in Malaya um, and who are also documenting their struggles and documenting what's going on. And whilst there is an inherent bias uh, and there are inaccuracies within this, the essential principle is that religion directly engages with socio-culture. It, you know, it engages with how people define themselves and it engages with how people live their lives and how they organize their societies. So religion, if we can look through the missionary element of it, is a good way to determine what's going on on the ground. Um, and particularly, well, so this is that now a look. Now we're going to look at Malaysian, uh, Chinese groups during this emergency through the lens of missionaries who are working amongst them. And there's me in the intersection. <laughs> now, I... I Prefer, obviously, to skip straight to my own research and talk bore you with that. Um, but I realize that some of you may not be particularly au fait with general Malaysian history. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is run through some of the contextual factors in each of these three areas. And hopefully at the end, we'll be able to look a little bit into what I do. So here is a picture of the Malay Peninsula. And from about 1824, there is a British presence here. 
From the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824, the British take control of the Strait Settlement, which is Penang over there, Malacca down here, Singapore, and Dinding, and I have no idea where that is. Um, and then from around 1874 till the 1920s, through a series of treaties with the Sultanates, the British start to take control of the rest of Peninsular Malaysia, which they eventually do. Now, a system of indirect rule. The British runs a central political and economic government, um, run by a high commissioner, but the Sultanates actually retain power over matters of culture and religion. And this is very important, these treaties stemming from the 1874 Treaty of Pankor, because although I'm running onto the next slide a little bit here, this directly impacts how ethnicities define themselves in the Malayan context. Because Malay Sultanates are allowed to retain control over cultural and religious matters, even though Islam has been a very prevalent force within Malaya, at this point, Islam becomes intrinsically tied to the Malay ethnicity. Because whenever a Malay uh, in, uh, identity is asserted, the only way they can do that is not through politics, it's through these matters of culture and religion. And it intrinsically makes ethnicity and religion bound together in this context. Religion becomes unbelievably important in Malay and is to this present day. Um, now, because Britain sees this as a really strategic position, both economically, uh, trade-wise, militarily, uh, it's the number one producer of tin and rubber in the world, Malaya, for those of you who aren't from there, and I think we might have a few, which is good. Um, and I don't mean to lecture you on your own history. Uh, that the British uh, implement a series of bringing in migrant workers, mostly Chinese, some Tamil Indians. And by the period we get to in the 1950s, around 50% of the population are either ethnically Chinese or ethnically Indian. The Malay, maybe 40%, it depends which figures you look at. They didn't really have censuses back then, so we're kind of guessing. Um, and this Chinese population will go on to have significant impact uh, within Malaya, and that's where my focus really lies. The immediate context for what I'm going to look at in the 50s, when we get to this, which is the uh, communist insurrection, uh, is World War II. World War II is unbelievably important for defining uh, this 1950s period within Malaya. Japanese occupy Malaya, coming in obviously from the east, uh, from 1941. Um, and this occupation is fundamental in shifting the pattern of race relations within Malaya. When the Japanese arrive, Malayan independence groups who've been starting to mobilize from the 1920s, 1930s, and who are ethnically Malay, join forces with the Japanese, and this isn't to say this is a majority of Malays, but some representatives, some of the more radical politic, political groups do. And what that means is that they march in the baggage train, train of the Japanese army, and when the Japanese do take control, Malays, ethnic Malays, are afforded positions in government, they're afforded political power, positions in the police, which gives them a lot of control. Conversely, the Chinese group, seemingly arbitrarily, are discriminated against by the Japanese army. And really, that harks back to previous conflicts between China and Japan in the last 50 years before this. Under the Suk Ching movement, the Japanese massacre thousands of Chinese and summarily imprison many more, forcing the Chinese population out of the cities and out of the plantations from their businesses and homes onto the fringes of the jungle. And within the jungle, the, Malaysian people, the Malayan people's anti-Japanese army emerges. Now, normally they name themselves Malayan peoples, but really this is a Chinese movement because the Malays don't need to fight the Japanese, they're already being privileged. Um, and from that movement grows the Malayan Communist Party. Realistically, although there are Guomintang agents within that group in the anti-Japanese army, it's a communist front. Uh, and the British fight with them and promise them legitimacy in the post-war aftermath. Now, at the end of the war, Japanese pull out when they surrender. The British are still in India, and there is a three-week period where the communists come out of the jungle, and I'm not sure why I'm smiling right now, and in the words of Tim Harper, who is the head of history here at Cambridge, they unleashed brutal revolutionary terror. They struck back at the Malays for their perceived discrimination during the war, and the Malays then begin to react as well. They organize under the banner of Islam, because intrinsically tied to the Malay ethnicity from Pankor in 1874. Um, and what that means is three weeks just open ethnic conflict. It kicks off. 
Um, the British come back in three weeks later, restore peace, but that tension is there and it's violent. Um, and through a series of other acts, such as the failure of the Malayan Union, um, which the British implemented to create racial equality, which uh, the United Malays National Organization uh, counteracted, they fought back, protested, got it rescinded. Racial inequality was reinstalled. Chinese people were banned from owning land and banned from cultivating land and were not given the political legitimacy, the Communist Party, which they demanded. And so from 48, the Communist insurrection begins. And that's the beginning of this sort of period which we're looking at. Now, I've talked a little bit about society and culture, and also this is from the Treaty of Pankow in 1874, when Islam became so codified in the Malay uh, identity, and which then leads religions to be codified in other identities, because it just becomes key to ethnicity at this point in Malay. The one thing I should mention society and culture-wise from this is because of the communist insurrection, the British come up with a solution. Um, and the solution is to take 10% of the Malayan population and forcibly resettle them into these new villages. And this is a map I found in a book hand-drawn by a missionary. Um, and what they do is they move the Chinese groups, and it was around 85% of, the Chi uh, of them are Chinese, around 15% are Indian, but they move 500,000 people from their homes and build them new villages, which are essentially compounds with wooden houses covered in barbed wire with a curfew. Um, and they're allowed to leave during the day, not allowed out after night or you'll be shot as a communist. Brilliant solution, obviously. Uh, but the idea was to uh, cut off the communist supply lines, because communists are still camped out in the jungle as they have been since World War II, by removing the support network around them from the edges of the jungle. But there's a secondary motive from the British. The British government believe that when decolonization happens, and we're getting into the post-war period, so nations are starting to decolonize, India from 47, and around the early 50s we get a lot of African countries decolonizing as well. They believe that when they decolonize, they don't want Islamic nationalists, the Malays, and they don't want communist Chinese, so they need a way of developing a modern, developed society based upon Western intellectual and ethical principles. And this is their solution. They reckon if they can move 10% of the population into these villages and show them the wonders of Western life by giving them you know, sewers, medical care, schools, none of which they actually did, by the way, um, then they can convert people to a Western democratic ideal, um, changing the na nature of Malayan society. I'm going to talk briefly about Christianity in Malaya as well, just because a lot of my work focuses on missionaries, so understanding the missionary context is quite important. Missionaries, Protestant British missionaries, had been active in Malaya from around 1816, but with very little success. Uh, the Malays from 1874 were forbidden for them to work amongst because of the codification of Islam within that ethnicity. So then they focused their attention on the Chinese, Chinese groups. Tamils were also quite staunchly Hindu, so that didn't work out either. But seeing as the Chinese religion, sort of Taoist religions, the British saw more as cultural. They believed that Chinese people had no religion. Um, that, that was the thought. And so they worked amongst the Chinese. But because most of these Chinese people, until the 1920s, were mostly transient workers in the tin mines, the rubber plantations, their efforts were mostly focused upon the business elite, you know, within the middle classes of the urban areas. And they got to them mostly through schooling. So the Anglophone, the English-speaking Christian population, up until the war and after, is predominantly a couple of thousand expatriates, British people in the, you know, living on the plantations, working in the government, um, and a few uh, urban elite Chinese who were converted to Christianity mostly for white-collar jobs um, and positions in the government, and their children who have been brought up through these mission schools. Interestingly, the most sizable Christian population at this point is not influenced by missionaries. They are Chinese migrants from China, well, obviously from China, uh, from Swatan and Fujian, who have been converted by Chinese-speaking missionaries in China before migrating to Malaysia. And we have a few thousand of them active. They have been completely ignored in all history. Like, I wrote, I wrote a little bit on them in this piece, but nobody has written on them, mostly because they write everything in Chinese. So anyone looking at this from an English standpoint has no idea what, what they're writing or saying about themselves. And also because they don't really have any clergy. They're run by influential laymen. 
um, people from amongst the congregation, elders. So that group, I mean, if any of you speak Chinese and fancy doing some historical research, you could write anything you want on that and people would believe you because nothing has been written. Um, but that group actually outlasts the Anglophone communities because they survive through decolonization. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think I've got five minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. Um, and what I look at is social engineering through new village ministry and through ecumenicalism on a national scale. I said to you before that there was a very small missionary population in Malaya, and they perpetually bemoaned that. The missionaries who were there were like, we've got nobody to work for us. We have not nothing. But for some reason, and nobody had figured this out until apparently I got round to it, <laughs> Malaya becomes, in the 1950s, the center of world missionary activity. N and no joke, hundreds and hundreds of missionaries flood into Malaya during the 1950s. And very few people have ever even documented that, let alone tried to figure out why. So that's quite important. I'm going to try and skip, skip through my notes to get to that point so I can talk about it a little bit. But that raises the question, why were they there? Um, and essentially, there's quite a number of reasons. But the biggest one, I would say, from my own reading and archival research, and also this is some examples of uh, archival materials that I've been looking through. I just thought I'd throw some pictures in. Um, this is a new village as well. Um, I realize I haven't explained all the pictures. I hope they made vague sense. Um, but what happens is between 46 and 49, uh, there is the Chinese Communist Revolution. And all missionaries, all Christians who are not Chinese, are kicked out of the country, thousands of them. China was seen as a big frontier uh, for Christianity. And a lot of money and a lot of men were pumped into that region. And suddenly, they were all expelled. And so partly what we have is a lot of missionaries with nowhere to go. And we also have a fundamental re-examination of how Asia is perceived by Christians, especially mission Christians. Um, and they, th they spend a lot of time thinking about this. A lot of them retreat from mission work entirely. Some of them take two years out, they all go off to Australia and like, what are we going to do next? And they pray about it and then decide. But they really don't know what to do. And a lot of them come to Malaya for a few different reasons. And I think, I think one of the main reasons is, is the communist threat within Malaya. The communist threat is there and they've just been booted out of one country by communists. And they don't want that to happen again. They want to make a stand there. Another reason is there's a massive Chinese population there. It's the biggest Chinese expatriate population in the world at the time, is in Malaya. Since then, places like, uh, places like America have overtaken it. But at the time, that was the largest Chinese population outside of China, and they saw that as a way back into China. I think one reason, again, because of the number of missionaries going in, the motivations are so varied. Everyone's got a different reason. One reason is Islam. One reason is that they see Islam as a real threat and there are strategic, strategic reasons here as well, um, in that it is, it is a, hub, a hub state. A lot of shipping and trade goes through Singapore and the like, and they believe that having a foothold there would help them in Asia, and there are not that many Christian nations in Asia. Very, very few. And so the idea of having a hub nation in Asia with a Christian population was very appealing at the time. Um, and they saw it as, quote unquote, a perilous situation. Um, another reason, and this will come up throughout the rest of this talk, the last few minutes, is government pressure. Uh, Harold Gurney and Gerard Templer, who were from 48 to 60, the two high commissioners of Malaya, sorry, 48 to 57, um, directly appealed for missionary assistance. And that is astonishing. Because never in the history of the British Empire had that secular wall come down. Although missionaries and state may have worked in tandem at times, working on similar things, they wanted similar objectives, they had never directly coalesced before. And so the fact that the colonial state was willing to bring in missionaries and appeal to them directly and offer to fund them is massive. Um, because they tried to use missionaries as an ideological bulwark a buffer against Islamic nationalism and communism. They thought if we can 
to an extent indoctrinate a certain amount of the population with Christianity, that'll give us a real foothold in combating what they see as dangerous ideologies. And the reason it was a prolonged violent decolonization is because these ide ideologies were seen as dangerous to Western values. The missionaries refused initially. Later on, they uh, go back to the government and say, hey, we would actually quite like your money, but we don't want anyone in Malaysia finding out about it. Um, because at this point in time, being associated with a colonial state is toxic. They're on their way out. And if you are tarred with that brush of being an imperialist, as soon as decolonization happens, you are getting kicked out of the country straight away. And so the missionaries, when they, when they say, oh, we actually will take some of your money, get the governments to pay it to their societies back home, first of all, so it can't be traced, then paid to the mission societies in Malaya, then paid to the regional churches, which is then funneled to mission work, medical care, educational things going on elsewhere. Um, and you can only f that we only found this out a few years ago. One guy ran about it before, and I found some similar documents. But they're basically back-channeling this money around, which is mad. Um, and I think, and then, and then, where are the missionaries actually operating? And the two key areas here are uh, yeah, here in the new villages and ecumenically. And ecumenically is more on a national scale. And <laughs> The new village ministry is seen as a real special opportunity for a large harvest. Large harvest being the words of the missionaries. In that the people who are now in the new villages, this 500,000 people, 10% of the population, have been ripped from their communities, ripped from their homes, and reassembled in a hodgepodge of peoples. In one village, you'll find people with different languages, different ethnic groups, different cultures. The society has been thrown apart, and they think, OK, these people have been torn, torn apart culturally, societally. We can rebuild them in a Western mold. And it seems a liminal space. They're separated from Malay influence and communist influence by, first of all, distance, and second of all, the barbed wire. Um, and they think we can rebuild these people from the ground up. And that's where most of the missionaries who are flooding into the country go. They go into the new villages. Um, and they start out. First of all, they collaborate, which is big. They see it as that but bigger threat that all the mission societies work together, that like we have to get Christianity established. Doesn't matter what denomination it is. I don't care that you're a Methodist and I'm a Presbyterian. We need to get Christianity in here now. They see it as urgent. And they start off trying to minister in these new villages. They start off trying to evangelize. And they realize pretty quickly that's not going to work. Partly because in, a lot, in Chinese society, to break with your family and do that was seen as unfilial. It would be a familial break you would be on your own, you'd be ostracized. And also, people were scared because they knew the next, the next government, the next power system was not going to be Western. It was going to be Islamic or it was going to be communist. And either way, being a Christian is not good news. Um, so they, they had very little success with direct evangelism. And so they moved on to what we call the social gospel. Um, and that essentially is an attempt to change the cultural complexion of these new villages. They attempt to rebuild their entire societal structure, which is insane. Um, but they think that by uh, bringing in medical work, by bringing in clinics, by bringing in schools that will educate you along Western lines, and by bringing in film crews to show you Western films, people would start to adopt Western intellectual and ethical values. And this is directly in line with what the government wants to do. Even though they want different things, even though the government want political control through that being a Western culture, so dem 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 uh, democracy they can work with and sort of keep on top of, and the Christians want people to become Christians, they both see imposing a Western culture as fundamental to those things happening. And so that's why they take the money and attempt to change the cultural complexion of these places. And... <laughs> They don't have success, but there is mass engagement. Whereas with evangelism, there's no engagement. 14,331 people are going to their medical clinics a month by 1952, four years in. So there is, and those clinics prop propound Western medicine and Western values. They have Western doctors. So there is some engagement there. I mean, they fail, but they establish schools, and there is some engagement. As missionaries, they're not working. They're not doing the job. But 
in establishing some level of respect and some level of interaction with Western culture, they get that. The Chinese culture is still very strong. And that's why the Chinese don't react how they want them to. But they did rip up their structures and they did provide them with amenities when otherwise they would have lived in squalor because the government did nothing. And that kind of, it doesn't work in any way. But there is an engagement there. Um, secondly is the ecumenical thing. Am I running out over time? I'll, just, I'll race through it. Basically, what happens is, whereas in the new villages, they try and reshape culture to be in line with Christianity, they figure, all right, what we should do instead with the national church is make the church more like Malaya. <laughs> but what they don't seem to figure out, and the government don't either, is that there is no Malayan culture. There is no national culture of Malaya. It's these ethnic groups, these ethno-religious, ethno-political factions, essentially. And they try and work to create this multicultural utopia. The government are doing it in the administration. They're trying to promote people from every ethnicity up into administrative roles uh, and to promote schools where everyone works together and everyone has a common language, whether that's Bahasa Malaya or English. And the church try the same thing. The church essentially try to redefine the Christ Christianity within Malaya as Malayan promoting indigenous leadership. Although, by the way, they talk a lot about promoting indigenous leadership, set up a training school in Singapore, never send anyone to it. Um, which is mad. And, and although they have this huge vernacular Chinese congregation who have come over from Swatong and Fujian, they don't make any of them ministers because they say they're unsuitable. And the unsuitability isn't based on their faith. These are profound Christians. The unsuitability is the fact that they don't adhere to Western cultural values. And it gets to the extent where they get so short of ministers, but they won't, they won't make any Chinese people ministers, they make fe female ministers. Which, for this period, is completely off the wall. But that's how opposed they are to making Chinese Christians ministers, because they don't adhere to the right values. The multiculturalism, the Western democratic ideal. So whilst they do try and redefine the church to Malaya in that instance, they try to redefine it to a Malaya which doesn't exist. They don't appeal to anybody. And so essentially what, my, in conclusion basically, is that during this hinge moment of the 1950s to try and define the future of Malaya, um, mission societies flood in a strategic location against these communist threats, these Islamic nationalist threats, and despite the hazards of colonial affiliation, they essentially basically do what the colonists were doing. Even though they want different things, they see transforming Malaya into a Western cultural democratic utopia as fundamental to making people Christian, just as the government see that as fundamental to making people Western democratic intellectuals. And whilst Christianity wasn't uniformly colonial, British missionaries clung to their sort of paternalist values. We know what's best. We need to change your culture to suit our values. Whether that's changing it to a Malayan culture or to a Western Christian culture. And that's why they don't survive. That's why these Anglophone communities die out during decolonization and the vernacular Chinese survive. And I hope that's all right for with everyone. <laughs>